Hello, good morning, everybody, or good evening, or good afternoon, uh, wherever you are dialing in from. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. Um, we'll give a, a minute or so to meet and greet here and uh, get it going. We have pretty good representation from different uh, parts of the world uh, again, so it's always great to see our friends uh, representing from Africa, Australia, Kenya, Indonesia, Malaysia, India. Yeah, all Welcome. over. Yeah, Egypt, amazing. Chile, Carlos, welcome. All right, uh, still folks are joining in. So Iowa, Dan, good morning. Good morning, Mario. So as uh, folks are uh, coming in, we will just um, kickstart here since we have a pretty packed schedule here for the next uh, 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, uh, so we'll get it going. Uh, and uh, again, I think the purpose of these sessions are to uh, create more kind of education environment. So if you have questions, if you have uh, observations as well, uh, feel free to share uh, in the chat box. Uh, and uh, feel free to also post your questions in the question box uh, here. Uh, and that's how we learn from each other. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to kickstart today's session. Uh, and today's topic is how to build a scalable blast optimization program presented by uh, Zach Tobias. Uh, before we begin uh, into the agenda, uh, some housekeeping items here are, uh, please uh, post your questions uh, in the question box so that we can moderate uh, all those questions at the end. Uh, any comments, you can type it in a chat box. Uh, we will share the recording of the presentation uh, in a few days, uh, as well as with the slides here. Uh, also, if you have uh, uh, a request for the uh, participation certificates, please uh, send it as uh, your email uh, uh, at hello at stereos.com and we will be getting back to you with certificates. Uh, so for today's uh, presentation, uh, we have uh, Zach here and uh, from the scalability side, you know, I think no uh, better kind of you know, uh, presenter here than Zach that how they have scaled uh, the optimization program or just uh, uh, running this as a practice at a scale uh, level. Uh, so uh, to just to introduce Zach here, uh, Zach uh, Tobias is a technical representative uh, who is in charge of 3D photogrammetry, bow tracking and volumetric surveying for Maurice Scott uh, located in Coopersburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, Zach has about four, five years of experience gaining both uh, his uh, Pennsylvania blasting license and part 107 drone pilot license. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Geology uh, from Kutztown University. Um, just a bit about uh, Estreos for those who have not uh, uh, known Estreos or attending for the first time. Estreos, uh, is a software platform uh, and we provide solutions uh, related to drilling, blasting and mining applications here. Um, and uh, uh, our goal through these sessions is to uh, engage uh, in the community of how we can better uh, learn from each other. Uh, and uh, that is a part of today's session as well, how other organizations or in the industry best practices uh, can be incorporated into the programs that you are building as well. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will uh, let Zach uh, kick off today's session. All right, thank you, Ravi. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you're on the East Coast, I hope you have your coffee ready. I know 
we have people from all over the place. So I'm sure we're going to be seeing, like uh, Robbie said, South Africa, Arizona, North Carolina. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, so I've been working with Strayos for about maybe four years now, uh, maybe five years since 2017. And I just want to go through a lot of the how we started, what we do now. Um, some people said things weren't possible, um, you know, from a small scale operations to now the large scale operations where between me and my um, teammate, we probably do as many as, you know, 10 profiles in a single day, whether they're multiple, um, multiple profiles in a single quarry, or we're going from, you know, Pennsylvania to New Jersey to uh, New York or, um, or Maryland. So we'll get this show on the road. So a little bit of what we're going to talk about, we're going to start with kind of how we've progressed, um, going from small scale operations to, you know, like I had mentioned to our large scale operations. So how we approach these blast optimizations, um, what the customer wants, you know, whatever they want, we want to make sure we can provide, you know, the best quality service for them and how we go about that situation. Uh, one of the workflows we do, one of our customers, we really kind of dialed in exactly what they want and they're utilizing, you know, GPS based software with our uh, Strayo software, getting, you know, highly precise models, accuracy and volumes, so on and so forth. So I'm going to go through, I call it the, like the pre layout to the post drill plans and all the data and deliverables that we're going to give to them. Some best, best practices, you know, I've been doing this for a while now. So some things I've learned along the way that I, you know, to me, I believe are kind of the best way to initiate these sorts of, um, you know, optimization skills and, you know, what I think are the best way to, you know, produce the highest quality models, um, success and benefits, pretty straightforward, how we're going to be measuring our success. Um, you know, the return on investment, whether you're efficient in the craft that you're doing and going through all those examples. Um, again, I just have examples, just kind of real world examples, different quarries, um, where we use some of these skills, where we may not use some of the skills. And then lastly, like an ROI for customers. So in the beginning, a little kind of a brief history lesson. Um, uh, when we first started, when I first came on board working at, uh, Mauer and Scott, we only had one drone. Um, at the time I wasn't really aware of any sort of 3d you know, aerial photogrammetry software. So our one drone just we had as like, hey, this is cool, we have a drone, but we didn't use it for anything more than just videotaping blasts. Um, you know, fast forward now, five, six years, fleet between we have about drones in the company. Um, now these are, you know, distributed between myself, my other technical uh, crew, and then there's plenty of blasters that are also utilizing um, you know, 3d aerial photogrammetry and, you know, designing their blasts, um, from the very beginning, you know, as many of you may have already been doing, you were using a bird and pole or a 2d laser to get your 2d profiles. Um, while many of our blasters were doing that again, we've kind of switched into using, you know, 3d aerial photogrammetry to get these profiles. And at the time myself, I was using a terrestrial 3d photogrammetry software. So very similar to using a 2d impulse later laser that i'm sure many of us are familiar with um, i would have to stand below the face you know acquire my blast area and take you know a series of photos in order to like encapsulate you know uh, a good quality image uh, or a representation of the face i'm looking at um, i'm sure as many of you have run into this issue if you're not you know immediately below the face or there's an obstruction in the way you know, your profile is only as good as, you know, your kind of initial setup. So by switching to, you know, an aerial photogrammetry software, it's been, you know, night and day difference. We're able to kind of do more work more efficiently and, you know, get higher quality models uh, because of that. As I had mentioned, a lot of our quarries now are being flown with drone technology, um, specifically utilizing Strayos. Um, the concept of model and go uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with Strayos, they use a cloud-based software, which I kind of think personally is the bee's knees. There's no real hardware that you need specifically other than a drone, um, you know, having a memory card, you, you know, do your job of taking photos of a face, you import the model, um, or the photo, sorry, 
into their cloud. The cloud does all the computing and processing for you. And from there, you can just go on to your next quarry, um, you know, kind of rinse and repeat. So there's no kind of lag time or wasted time where you have to sit and wait for these models to finish. You can always be, um, you know, multitasking and doing something else. Um, with these models, kind of to improve our safety, making sure everything's drilled and everything's correct to how the blaster wanted it, we do use, um, we bore track all of our holes. Um, we use, we have a few different uh, rotted and cable devices that we implement this bore track data into our models. So we know, hey, if the hole is supposed to be a 15 degree, it was drilled as true as possible, or if there's any heavy deviation for left or right, we, you know, those will all be calculated and figured out just so we can, you know, uh, move forward with the safest possible blast. Um, in regards to GPS, we never use GPSing in our blast design, uh, maybe a couple times here and there, but it was too cumbersome and there wasn't a real need, nor did the technology we were using really uh, worked with it that well. Um, nowadays, one of our workflows that I will mention, we do GPSing for every shot, every layout, every post drill layout, and it's really been helping us keep kind of ahead of the drillers, keep ahead of, you know, production and everything is repeatable and we're getting really good precise data, whether it be shot volume calculations, um, hole placement, hole designs, whatever it is, it's, it's been incredible. Um, lastly, a little different from, you know, blast optimization, but with surveying initially way back in the day, I did all of the stockpile surveys with uh, an old Quarryman laser. Now it worked well for many years, but the time investment to acquire all the data you need at some of these plants we do where they may have 30 more stockpiles, it was very cumbersome. Um, you know, we could spend easily two days at one place, which would kind of lock us up. So we couldn't get other profiling work done as we switched to an aerial based, you know, photogrammetry system. With that being said, we have been able to, you know, rapidly get these models done. Um, and while we're taking photos with our drone, <coughs> laying out GPS points or ground control points for, to increase our accuracy of the floor, while after all that's taken care of, we can also be utilizing that time while the model <coughs> is processing and doing other work. So there's not just a trade off of, you know, okay, well, I have to do this stockpile models, I'm only going to be doing that. No, you can do that data. And you can also be doing something at you know, at the same time. So multitasking has been a huge benefit for us um, and how flexible Strayos is with that sort of stuff. Um, so I have this poll question that I put up here. Um, I believe I have to create it um, pretty much for this first poll. I wanted to know in the audience for you guys, what sort of tools do you use for calculating burdens? Um, so I know for us, you know, some people st still may use a 2D laser. Um, other people may use a burden pull and tape, or if you use any sort of 3d software, I just kind of wanted to gauge from the audience, what you guys use. I just got to put this question together. If it's uh, taking a bit of a technical difficulty, Zach, if it, uh, we can probably skip it. Yes. Yeah. We might just want to skip it then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it seems yeah. like it was a little much. Yeah, there, there was some glitch in there. Yeah, it was not showing up. So we can probably skip the polls. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. So in terms of how Mauer and Scott approaches blast optimization, um, the first thing we want to know is, you know, with either it's existing com customers or new customers, more or less, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? What is the goal moving forward? Is it, you know, for starters, is it over drilling? Are we seeing benches that are just very misnumbered as in, you know, the blaster may be shooting it with a 2d laser saying, ah, you know, this bench is 
40 feet, but they're drilling it. The drillers are drilling it to 47 feet or something like that. We want to maintain consistency and we don't want any over drilling because at the end of the day, someone's paying for that extra drilling for the most part. Uh, maybe drilling's fine, but we kind of want to remove a middleman. Um, smart drills are kind of, I don't deal with too many smart drills uh, personally, but the smart tech, uh, the smart drill technology is definitely out there. And the kind of removing the middleman, what I mean by that is, you know, normally a blaster will design a layout, um, paint it on the ground, and, you know, that takes them X amount of hours, depending on the size of the shot. Maybe it's 45 minutes, maybe it's three hours, of course, depending on the size. Um, utilizing Strayo specifically and with smart drills, we can design a whole digital blast model in Strayos from there. And especially with using ground control points, we can re rectify all those positions. So they're, you know, within, you know, GPS grade accuracy, export that to a drill plan, feed that drill plan to a smart drill. And there's no need for a blaster to go lay anything out. The driller can move up to those, you know, if it's a virgin face, and there's nothing on there. The driller can just move up to where it says it needs to be and start drilling. So it's definitely a super big time saver, just adding more efficiency into, you know, production, getting shots drilled, getting, you know, um, shots on the ground, starting to clean up the muck pile, cleaning, uh, making sure the crusher is constantly running. Or maybe the goal is for pattern design. Um, are your layouts not that precise? Uh, you know, the blaster lays out for, let's just say a 15 by 18 pattern, but you know, it's the blast is coming out very funky or something doesn't seem right with using a GPS layout we have been able to get within an inch of accuracy laying out, you know, as many as 164 holes, um, you know, precision accuracy. If the layout calls for 13 by 15 or, you know, bang on 13 by 15 layout for, you know, ent the entirety of the shot, which just adds, you know, to a better, um, you know, a better blast overall, or maybe you're the muck, you want to kind of see what sort of muck pile, you'll get um, yielding from the blast that's, you know, about to happen, or maybe down the future, you want to kind of fine tune your muck pile prediction. Um, Strayos has a module in there where you put in the parameters that are necessary, uh, given the, you know, the tensile strength, the uh, rock density, your stemming height, the, your powder factor, a plethora of different um, parameters. And in there, Strayos can predict about what the muck pile should look like based off of those parameters. Um, there also is a muck pile analysis tool that post blast, you would do a flyover of your muck pile and the machine AI will learn based off of how you blasted, um, moving forward, what it will look like based off of how the rock reacted. Um, maybe if that's not it, maybe you're looking for, you know, to particle sizes of rocks. Obviously no one wants big goober rocks in their shots. Uh, maybe you want it smoked where you have a lot of fines. Maybe you don't want a lot of fines. There is a, um, there's a, you know, a fragmentation analysis module. That's also great where you can really fine tune and see what sort of material sizes you're getting in these blasts, um, as well as the prediction tool with, um, uh, excuse me, with the prediction tool in terms of, uh, particle analysis, there's also, it can analyze it with their AI and over repetitive blasts, it will learn how the rock fragments and what sort of uh, size chunks you will be getting in your shots moving forward. Um, if maybe that's not it, maybe it's bench height inconsistency. Um, I'm sure we've all seen plenty of places where we, you may have a floor or a bench that's very wavy. It's not uniform. And, you know, what are we doing to make sure we're getting proper drill plans, making sure we're drilling them to the proper depths? Uh, most of the time it's just, okay, well, this looks like it goes up a foot. This looks like it goes up two feet, um, especially on a heavily sloped area. You know, it's kind of anyone's guess. What what uh, steps are we taking to make sure we're getting, you know, precision layouts? Uh, utilizing ground control points uh, and laying out shots in Strayos, we can get pretty much perfect uh, drill depths for these shots. We'll know exactly how deep uh, and how much pitch there is on these benches relative to the floor. We can set a, uh, you know, floor elevation as a, our ground control. And through that, we can just have, again, perfect drill plans. So kind of going on with the, the bench heights, uh, maybe we have uneven floors. Again, if you have a choppy floor, there could be, uh, you know, a, many different reasons for that. Maybe the loader operator is drilling or sorry, is 
picking up the sub drill and is drilling down to the hard rock, or he's skimming over boulders that are in the ground and you're, you now have what you think is uh, high bottoms. So using some floor control analysis in Strauss, we can do uh, massive, pretty much mine flyovers, and it will give us a heat map as we can see in this photo down here of, you know, our high spots and low spots. You can set multiple gradients of different colors. Uh, as well as, you know, what sort of step size interval you want to see, whether it's two feet, three feet, four feet, am I, you know, is it negative or positive? Do I have a cut? Do I have fill? What is it? So that's something we can look at. Um, and lastly, I think this is one of the biggest one that most people are kind of looking at is maybe volume discrepancies. Obviously, for those of you who've been blasting for a long time, you know, how are we calculating our volumes? Are we doing, you know, our shot parameters, multiplying it through and then dividing it to get, you know, a pretty rough, close guess? Or do we want, you know, accuracy? Do we want precision on what our actual volume is? Well, we've been doing a lot of work lately where we've been doing ground control point controls with our models and getting very accurate, very realistic numbers on what sort of tonnage is actually coming out of these shots. Um, you know, the Strayos AI will utilize the, like an exact replica of the face. So rather than just saying, okay, well, I'm laying out on a, let's say a 13 by 15 pattern and you're just averaging through the face, uh, Strayos is taking every crack and crevice, uh, whether you have five feet at the top or 20 feet at the bottom, and it's yielding the most accurate volume it can. Um, we're going to skip this poll question, but I was curious if anyone in the crowd uh, utilized ground control points when designing blasts. I know a lot of people may use it when doing mine planning maps, but I was just kind of curious at the time if anyone used it specifically for doing blast designs. So moving into our pattern workflow, one of our bigger customers, uh, we service a lot of their quarries we kind of came up with a, you know, a standardization, like an SOP on what they wanted from us, um, how they wanted their layouts done and what the deliverables, what they want us to, you know, what, what results they want at the end of the day, they want to see how everything's doing. So I'm going to go through this start to finish. We're going to first work on the layout aspect. So, you know, if we have a virgin face, it's cleaned up, there's no muck in front of the face how we initialize it, how we start it. And then the next slide, we'll kind of go over what we're doing after the shot's been drilled and how we're, um, you know, accumulating all of our data together. So first things first, when we have a, a bench that's ready, that's been prepped, our first uh, mission is pretty much to utilize our GPS system. Our GPS system is going to allow us to get, you know, super accurate um, elevation measurements on both the bench and the floor. Um, I'll kind of talk about in my best practice slide what I think is the best way to kind of approach this. But for now, we will put a, you know, a, a number of points on the bench. If the bench is flat, it's pretty easy. But if we have, you know, heavy slopage or there's, you know, two tiers in these shots, we'll take more than maybe necessary uh, ground control points just so we get accurate, um, accurate elevation data. And then we will also go down on the floor whether it's an immediate floor or it's, you know, two benches down below, just so we have a relationship between bench and floor. After that, um, oh, one of these other things that we've been currently doing with the GPS that I almost forgot to mention was a lot of our customers where they are asking for GPS, they have been getting uh, permanent base stations set up. So it's really sped up the efficiency on our end where I'm sure any of you who have used a GPS system before, you know, you have to set up the base station, whether it's on a known point or you just kind of make, you know, find a base point and, you know, key in where you want your base station to be. Our customers are now providing us with frequency data where we can tie in our rover, uh, removing us uh, from having to set up our own base station. We tie into their strategic, um, you know, base point. And from there, it kind of skips a step for us, um, allowing us to kind of get into their pits connect to their base station, uh, and then we can go out with our rover and everyone's between, uh, the myself, Mauer and Scott and the quarry, we're all on the same, you know, playing field with, all right, well, we're all using the same base station to get, you know, similar results. And we're all, we all know what's going on. So once we get our ground control points down, the next step is to get our drone out and we're going to pretty much fly the entire model. 
Um, I don't know how many people have used Strayos before, but we're going to be taking a series of photos from, you know, our aerial, obviously our aerial photos. We're going to be taking top down photos. So we're going to be looking straight down on the bench and the floor to gain good resolution. And then once we do that, we're also going to be taking, um, angled photos. These angled photos we generally take at about 45 degrees and we're going to be skimming across the crest line and the toe to gain um, accurate representation of what the face looks like. In occasions where the face is really broken back or it's very choppy, it almost looks jagged and has, you know, I'll call it shark teeth-esque um, face. Sometimes we'll drop the drone even further down and take another series of angled photos where we may tilt the camera up a little more because sometimes depending on the severity of these cuts, it will not properly model underneath. So just adding more photos completely solves that issue. And then we're making sure we get every, you know, nook and cranny of this face. Um, after we compiled all of our photos, we will go to Strayos and we will upload our info to the cloud. And we will also import our ground control point file from there. Strayos will um, automatically rectify these GCPs. It's just going to confirm that um, you're saying, all right, well, this is GCP point one, this is GCP point two, and we're just going to move down the line and make sure that it's, you know, correctly associating with each of those ground control points. So after that's done, we will upload to the cloud and the model will start processing in that time. Um, depending on the size of the model, we can you know, you can do anything else, whether you have another shot you have to get done, whether it's a shot report, uh, there's board tracking to be done, or there's other models to be working on. It frees you up um, where you can be doing anything else. Once that model is finished, um, usually I will contact the blaster and they're already aware of what's I've already, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a quarry where, you know, we're kind of doing this ground control point, you know, pre layout fl uh, flyover. And I'll discuss with him and they will design the shot for me so that I can lay it out with my Rover. So the blaster I'll communicate with, he'll tell me the floor elevation we're shooting to. Um, in this case, if you guys can see down below, um, this specific shot that I have, we have the floor elevation endpoint at 749 feet. So all the holes are referenced to that floor point. There's no guessing. And as you can see, the start point elevation is the bench height. That is just the comparison of the two. And from that we yield our total drill depth. And then I also have the four feet of sub drill included there as well. So once the blaster puts all that together, I put this little, um, Excel sheet together of all this data. And then I go out with my Rover that I have initially set up on the permanent base station. And I will track through with my Rover and lay out every single hole, you know, in chronological order or how the blaster has designed it. So if you can see at the top right of this slide, we, we always start on the, you know, front left, I'll call it, even if it's a second or third row hole, especially with an open corner, we always start left to right. Um, there's, I almost think there's nothing more important than just being consistent. If you don't want to keep switching it up, sometimes you do it to the right. Sometimes you do it to the left, make sure you're consistent. So when we send this data out, the drillers, the quarry managers, um, and the blasters are all well aware of how you're starting it and it's just repeatability. So everyone's on the same page. We don't want any errors in this. After all that's done and we've laid out the shot, uh, obviously it will look something like this on the bottom. I will go out and paint all the rocks, put the arrows of the necessary angles, 10s, 15s, 20s. Um, if it's a vertical, we'll just paint an orange rock. And then after that, we can kind of prepare for the driller to come in. The driller will get also get a copy of this, um, kind of drill plan, this layout drill plan that we have down here. All they need to know is for each specific hole, what am I drilling though? Am I drilling, you know, 60 feet or, you know, am I drilling 70 feet? So this has a breakdown of, uh, exactly the drill depth for each specific hole. Um, I had another poll question here. I'll just read it off though. Um, after a shot is drilled, are the face holes bore tracked and is the blast area reprofiled for accuracy? Um, pretty much. I was just curious if if any of you do do bore tracking, um, on post drilled shots, or if you just, if you lay it out, you're just like, okay, well that should be good. And you kind of trust that the driller did, you know, there's no deviation of drift or that the holes drilled to where it's supposed to be. Um, I know for us, what we do a pre and post, we will lay out the shot in Strayos, make sure everything's good. We'll always follow back up, um, re GPS the holes to make sure we have proper placement. 
and then in, uh, incorporate, you know, face bore track data into our shots to make sure there's no drift to make sure the angles are true to what they were initially laid out as. So now to the post drill workflow. Um, so obviously post drill, meaning after everything's been drilled, the shots done, the face is cleaned up if it wasn't already. And we kind of go, you know, back to square one, we're going to make sure that, uh, first things first, we're going to set up our GPS. We're going to go through and we're going to, uh, you know, GPS every single hole in the same order it was laid out in. Um, the reason for this is so we can eventually do a collar deviation report, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit, but as, uh, to repeat and kind of do the, the same procedure over and over, we want to make sure we're all on the same page. So when we GPS the collars of these holes, we always stake from the back right corner. Um, obviously it's a, a, you know, a circle casing, so it's not really a corner, but the back right of the collar, just for repeatability, whether I'm doing it or another tech's doing it, or even if the quarry's doing it for, you know, whatever reason, we're repeating the same process over and over from layout to, you know, uh, post drill. It's always the back right corner. Um, after we GPS all of the holes in our shot to get the finalized, um, you know, hole location, we will do another flyover. Now, if your ground control points have been moved or the loaders came in and, you know, we're prepping the bencher or the drillers ran over it, you will have to lay out a new set of ground control points. But a lot of times that's not the case. And you can just reuse the ground control points you currently have on the floor. Um, the floor hasn't changed. It's not like any other shots have happened. So you will re refly the, the model as post drilled. You'll rectify that model yet again with ground control points. And then you'll have on this third picture I have here on the right, we will be seeing what the, um, the post drill looks like. And we'll start, uh, importing all of the GPS holes into this shot. Um, after we import all the necessary holes, um, I think for this specific shot on the top here, it was about 164. So once all of these holes are imported, we can go through and check uh, a deviation report. Um, after that, we will then, uh, after that, we will then do a burden report, which we are incorporating yet again, our, um, bore track data for. So. If we have 40 face holes, 20 face holes, however many, however many number of face holes that we have, we will go through bore track, all of them, and we will then imp import that data into our, you know, finalized uh, burden report. Um, one kind of little rule of thumb, um, that I'll, I'll mention is I would kind of recommend if you're doing it, uh, bore tracking and then reflying it, I'd always start reflying it first. Um, reason being when you refly, rectify your ground control points. Once that model is up and rolling, if you can bore track, you're kind of doing two things at once. The model's already working and processing. You can get your bore tracking done. And depending on the size of the shot, uh, whether you had to take more photos or there's a lot of face holes that need to get done, when you're done bore tracking, you're starting to import the data. Um, the model's already done. There's no waiting around. So that's what I, you know, kind of preach the most is efficiency and getting as much done in your time possible and making uh, well worth your wild. Um, lastly, so for the post drill, what we're yielding or the results that we're giving to the customer, um, I'll call it the, the deliverables, they will receive a burden report for the layout. Now this burden report, uh, for layout, um, it's a little small, but if you guys can see it on the very bottom, um, this is just pretty much outlining our blast design. So for this, we have our number of rows. We have four rows. Our average spacing for this pattern was a 16 foot spacing. Um, the crest burden that we were designing for was about 14 feet. And then on here, it gives our total drill length. That's including sub drill. So obviously the total depth of the holes and for all hundred holes, um, in this uh, particular shot, how much sub drill and then the azimuth. So the azimuth is just referring to the orientation of the, um, the, the layout we initialized, um, where the holes are tracking now. Obviously not all shots are nice box cut shots and they're straight off the face. You may have open corners. So the angle of these holes is going to change and we'll accommodate by putting that in there. Um, and then lastly, I would almost argue the most important for us and maybe for the customer is making sure the shot volume is accurate. So on the bottom down here, uh, we have the total shot volume for this specific shot. Now this one, we're yielding about 44,000 cubic yards. Um, and I think when comparing it to, I'll call it like a longhand method, multiplying out, you know, our shot parameters, 
we're usually coming in a little under, which would make sense due to we're averaging, you know, a 14 by 16 design, whereas when we're utilizing Straos, we are getting, you know, accurate representation of the face, um, for, you know, for whether it's short on the top or light on the top, rather, and heavy on the bottom, we're getting, you know, a true, this is what my face is actually, and this is how I'm calculating the volume. So after we have our um, burden report for layout, we also have our drill plan. The drill plan, as I mentioned on the previous slide, is what the, the blaster will get, the quarry uh, manager will get, and the driller. And obviously, I'll have a copy myself. This is just to say, okay, here's the whole locations of the pre-layout holes. This is the um, depth for each specific hole, and we'll make sure it matches up after the drillers are done, making sure that it was drew, drilled true to what we had initialized it for. Um, lastly, or the other two things we'll need are our post drill borehole locations. So this will be another, um, a CSV or an Excel file that will just have our northing and Eastings. This is just to confirm, you know, when we're running our deviation report, we know, okay, the hole started at one spot when we laid it out and where did it end up? Uh, was it moved? Did it stay in the same spot? And if it did move, how much did it move two feet? Did it move three feet to, you know, change the you know, the pattern design that we, we between the blaster and myself had initially designed, you know, that's something for us that's important to know. Um, and then we have a deviation report, which I'll go into further detail on the next slide. And then one of the other things, the, we will also have a, the burden report, which will just be the board track data implemented into that. So there's about five things that we turn in as deliverables for our, um, our customer. So a little bit more about the collar deviation analysis. Um, so Strayos recent, I would say maybe two weeks ago, Ravi, if not a little more, um, you updated it. And um, the update has been really awesome. It really shows and utilizes um, the app. It, it's taking every single hole in the shot and it's showing, you know, if it's precise and accurate. So, I mean, you could argue this is fairly accurate. It's, you know almost true if the dead center is zero meaning the hole didn't move at all from uh when we we're where we initially laid it out to where it is currently um this is all right and it's fairly precise as well given that you know the main cluster is you know close to the center um also it may look a little erratic but these rings i don't know if you all in the audience can see are not even uh, a foot spacing so these holes are all within you know maybe six inches of where they were initially designed with the exception of this hole that's at the the outer end but every once in a while we'll get one that's a little deviated out but it's no big deal um the the purpose of this is to kind of keep an accountability making sure that when drillers are setting up obviously you know they may be running over holes or you know the hole gets lost under a cuttings pile and they're trying to find it we want to make sure that what we had initially um you know did a precision layout for that when we come back our pattern design hasn't changed. So if we're trying to stay true to our, you know, 14 by 16 design, we want to make sure that we're not now shooting, uh, I don't know, let's say 14 by 18 between some of the, the holes. We want to make sure our inter row burdens and our face burdens are true to how we initially designed it to make sure that moving forward, the blast comes out the way we want it. Um, if these holes are moved too much and the deviation reports too um, very great, now we're shooting heavier or even lighter spacing. So in the case of shooting heavier, um, heavier interrow burdens, one of the issues we could have, well, we all know the path of least resistance. So if you're designing a shot with 12 feet of stemming on top, and now you have a heavier interrow burden, well, if you're pushing way more burden than you initially planned on, because the hole moved so much, now there's a possibility that um, stemming or the, you know, the hole is going to shoot up out of the air and then we could have issues of fly rock or stemming ejection or whatever it is. So it's nice to know how much the holes have moved if a lot or a little, and we can kind of, you know, rectify that and have a game plan moving forward. Okay. Well, this hole moved too much moving forward. Now I know maybe I got to dump, uh, dump a couple buckets on it to make sure it doesn't blow out the top. So I initially talked about, um, muck pile analysis before. Um, so this is a little, this is more in depth of what that is. So this is, um, fragmentation analysis. So as you can see over here on the right hand side, we have, you know, our, our percent of passing, um, and then we have our fragmentation size on the bottom. 
and then we have our three columns. We have our fines, target zone, and oversize. Obviously, we have you know kind of a everyone has a sweet spot in their plant of what sized um, you know particle size rock they want. No one wants big ubers, um, obviously, because that just means more time that's required to hammer them out and then you know to get them to pass through the crusher. So utilizing this you know uh, Strayos machine learning AI, it will help kind of fine tune based off of you know repeated blast. Um, you would do a muck pile flyover, and from that, the, the, the AI software will learn exactly how these shots are uh, performing based off of your current, you know, pat, whether it's pattern design or your powder factor, how much stemming you're holding. So kind of going through this and reflying every shot for the, the muck pile to get the best performance, this is super helpful. I mean, the muck pile prediction tool, again, is only a prediction but the muck pile analysis tool or the AI and same with the fragmentation AI is kind of the best way moving forward to really fine tune your blast to a, make sure your muck piles come out nice, whether you want them to hump up more or you want them to, you know, shoot out more and they're flatter. Um, you want to make them easier to dig. You want less oversized. Um, the analysis AI is just constantly learning. The more data you feed it, the more precise and the better results you're getting from a lot of these um, blasts. So now we'll move into kind of what I think are best practices. Um, I, I, I think they're pretty simple, simple practices, uh, but just some things I've learned over, you know, the years doing it are um, first things first is you got to have the right equipment for the job. Um, it all comes down to equipment. Again, kind of the approach I talked about in the very beginning, what exactly are we trying to accomplish here? So, you know, if you don't need, if you're not looking to do ground control points or any sort of G, uh, GPS modeling um, integrated in your Strayus layouts, well, then you don't need a GPS. Um, but if you are, kind of isolate and figure out, well, well, what do I need? So if any of you are familiar, there are RTK drones, um, real-time kinematic drones, and they utilize like PPK processing. Um, from that, I would think that's most effective and most efficient if you're doing large scale kind of mine operations, um, primarily with mine planning. Um, if those of you who are not familiar with an RTK drone, the drone is the rover, um, and you have a you would set up your base station on a known point um, of whatever elevation, and that drone is being constantly monitored um, from that base station of exactly um, you know precisely exactly where it's at, and it's getting excuse me, precise um, elevations of the floor and each uh, sequential bench. So for large scale mine planning, I would think the RTK drone is kind of your, would be your solution. If you're going out with a GPS, um, like a handheld unit and a, with a rover, if you're trying to get multiple GPS points on multiple benches, you could be taking, you know, depending on the size of the quarry, you could be out there for two, three hours, just staking out points. When with the RTK drone, you can tie into a base station and you know boom off you go just put the drone up in the air and nowadays when you're doing mine planning uh with with uh um with drones there's it just goes on autopilot there's really not much you have to do so kind of first things first make sure you have the right equipment um we use a gps space station rover if i didn't make that apparent enough um for our scale of operations we're not doing much mine planning. It's mainly just, you know, blast solutions, blast optimization. So using a GPS and Rover have been uh, uh, more than adequate enough for our practices. Um, thirdly, what sort of technology or software are you using? So that's the kind of the hardware side of it, but the software side of it, what are you using? Are you using a, you know, something like Strayos, um, aerial based 3D photogrammetry system? or are you using uh, you know, a terrestrial base, um, are you using 2D lasers, are you using a 3D photogrammetry, um, uh, you know, a terrestrial based software where you have a camera and you're taking sequential photos to calculate you know, your burdens and whatnot. So you kind of figure out what your goal is. Um, I almost think nowadays with the price of drones, you know, it's kind of a no brainer when it comes to the um, aerial based stuff with, with especially with Strayos, I mean, the flexibility you have in order to, you know, create models, um, even if you don't have adequate, um, you know, viewing of the face you're trying to profile, I think it's kind of a no brainer for that. So I would always err on going with an aerial based uh, system. Communication, 
This one, again, seems pretty straightforward, but uh, it is very shocking when people don't communicate. You may not have any clue what's going on. Um, so I probably bug the heck out of the blasters, the quarry managers, and even my own team because I'm always trying to figure out and know, hey, what's going on? What's coming down the pipeline? Is there any areas that are um, that are prepped that are asking for you know ground control points? Are there any areas that are looking for a layout? You know whether the answer is yes or no, or you know yes, it will be later in the day. These are important things for me to know. Uh, then I can communicate with my team and you know other blasters. So when we go to these shots, we can get be as efficient as possible as possible and get you know the job done. If there's if I'm going up to a specific quarry to do a post drill flyover to uh, re GPS to bore track and all that stuff. If there's another area that the quarry super or the quarry manager has said that they want to lay out at, I can also get that done, start GPSing it, put out ground control points and get that model ready for the blaster to design it. And then I can lay it out. So it's well worth my time to communicate with as many people as I can as much as possible. So we can keep, you know, everything running as smoothly as possible. So pretty much having a game plan is most important, uh, making sure you know what's going on. Um, so the process, making sure, uh, my third point is the process, uh, making sure that you have, you know, strategically placed your G ground control points. Obviously there's, you may find yourself in uh, situations where, well, where am I going to put my ground control points? Obviously the bench is pretty easy. If the bench is prepped uh, whether it's flat or it's sloped or whatever, um, trying to figure out where you want to put your ground control points can vary. The bench is the easy one. I'd say for me, the hardest one is the floor. Obviously, we're always shooting onto the floor. So to kind of save yourself some time, if you can reuse your ground control points from maybe when you did the layout, whoops, what happened to that? Okay. Um, if you can reuse these ground control points from when you did the layout, that will save you time, especially if it's large quarries. I know there's a couple that we, um, where we do our modeling and profiling, where if you have to go down to the bench below, it's at least a 15 minute drive trying to get around all the haul trucks, all the loaders, all the customers that are coming in, you know, all the triaxles. So if you're able to reuse your previous layout um, ground control points, that can save you a lot of time and save you kind of a whole extra step of having to go down below and, you know, retake these points. So putting them in strategic spots, uh, whether it's away from the, um, away from the direction of the blast, if the blaster is going to pull it off of one side, maybe put them kind of hide them on the other side. Um, you may lose one or two, but you know, at the end of the, at the end of the day, it's best to kind of put them in strategic spots. What I'll try to do is put them outside of my blast range. Um, there's one of the quarries that we go to, they're shooting two adjacent shots, um, the South wall and a West wall, which I will, I have a slide on that a little later. And from there, I try to put hide mine on the back right corner of the floor, just because really no, there's, there's no shooting going over there. So to to not have to go down to the floor every single time. It just speeds up how much I can get done at their place and get to, you know, the rest of their quarries uh, from the same customer. Um, also flying areas that are um, larger than you may initially need. Um, going back to my, uh, my map of the adjacent shooting shots. Initially, I would only go there to just fly specifically one of the shots. But if we're flying a large area, it can be beneficial because there are times where I may have a, the inclination that the quarry manager may want to shoot there, but he doesn't have an idea yet. And then after I leave and I'm going to my next place, they may say, oh, hey, are you still there? I, we actually want to start laying out on this, this uh, adjacent face. Well, what I'll usually do is I'll fly a larger than just my area of the uh, initial blast that may be done, and I'll incorporate kind of what I think they may want. Uh, and that has saved my skin um, a lot of times because I was able to pretty much duplicate my model and not only get my post drill work done for my one model, I can always get now the pre layout uh, data done for that model as well without having to make another stop back in there. So again, uh, kind of my reoccurring theme is just being as efficient as possible communication, making sure you kind of know you're in the now with, you know, blasters, your tech team and the managers, the quarry managers. So how do uh, we manage success at Mauer and Scott? Now all these play a role within each other. Um, again, my key point that I keep harping on is efficiency. 
efficiency is super important. You don't want to be making multiple trips to one quarry, um, especially for um, instance, I live in Pennsylvania and you know, we're driving up to New York for some of these quarries that are about two and a half hours away. So if you're driving that far up every single morning, you don't want to have to be making multiple trips to that place. You want to be as efficient as possible, driving up to these places, getting as much done as you can. So again, communication, getting what you came to do, if not more, and then you can go and, you know, go on with your day and get to these, the next places. Um, our quality of work, uh, obviously we want to show our customers that the quality of work that we're producing as well as they, these two go together, but the results, the quality of uh, we are completing the tasks that they are asking kind of like a uh, SOP. This is what they want here, the deliverables, and we're, you know, yielding them good quality work and they're confident about the results we're sending them, uh, which also plays into customer satisfaction. Um, obviously if we're doing a good job, the results are good. The quality in which we are doing it is, you know, up to their standards. They're going to be happy that they on the receiving end are getting the, the, um, you know, the data and the results that they want. And obviously that's, you know, a, that's great for both of us. We're putting in the work that they want, as well as they are getting out of it, everything that they're asking, they're happy with it. So if they ever need to come back to old shots, they can say, all right, well, they've been doing a great job, you know, from here on out, they're doing everything we've been asking them and it's all great. Um, and reliability. So with reliability, we want to make sure that, um, we can come back and everything's repeatable. Um, that's one of the big reasons why we have been incorporating ground control points into a lot of our models. Uh, by incorporating these ground control points and using known base stations, as I had mentioned before, we're using a permanent base station to tie into. It's super huge because when we shoot a shot, how we kind of lay out the next preceding shot, we will use, you know, GPS location on the, the end holes on the last row, do our back markers off of that. And then we have now established our face row for the next shot. So being able to come back and, you know, repeat reliably repeat this process over and over and over, um, it is super important. So, you know, all these points are kind of, how are we managing our success? Um, and you know, we, I believe we checked the box on all of these. So poll number four, um, I'll just read it off again. If there's any area in regard to blast optimization in which you're looking to improve, um, whether this is kind of when I went and talked about the approach, if this is whether it's over drilling, you're looking to incorporate smart drills, are you having, you know, bench height inconsistencies or any sort of issues with that? Um, or again, our volume calculations, you know, muck pile analysis, pretty much if there's any areas you specifically want to improve and, you know, utilizing Strayos and ground control points is something, you know, down the line that you're really looking into. So here's some of the, the next couple slides I have ahead are just some examples um, where we're doing a lot of this ground control point, um, you know, incorporation with these quarries. So I was kind of mentioned a little bit about this shot. So this was about 164 hole shot. Uh, this quarry specifically does anywhere between four to four and a half million tons a year. Um, and we are doing all the blasting for them. So, you know, they definitely give us a run for our money, trying to keep up with the scale at which they are, um, you know, blasting and trying to, you know, consistently crush at. So, as I mentioned before, we designed the face row from the, the GPS coordinates of the last row, um, of holes. We'll take the last end points of each, um, the fourth row, I believe was the shot in front. We'll take the fourth row. We'll take the first and the last hole in that row. And we'll do back markers, you know, I forget what it was, maybe 16 feet. And that's how we will initially start our hole number one and our hole number 41. We'll draw our line across. We'll implement the parameters that we're designing the shot for. Uh, this shot may have been a 13 by 15 uh, blast design. And from there, Strauss will populate all the rows. We'll in introduce a staggered pattern. And this whole entire shot, I believe, was either drilled on a five or a 10 degree for all the holes. Um, Given that the scale of this shot is very large for a blaster to lay this out with his tape measure, um, I was talking to the blaster. It would definitely take him a while, um, especially by himself. I think this shot is about 800, maybe 500 to 800 feet long. Um, I don't know if anyone has a tape measure that long, but we surely don't. So the most efficient way to lay this out 
was to utilize our ground control points, do a you know pre-layout flyover. The blaster designed the shot. I exported all that data, and then I went out with my G my GPS, uh, my rover, and I just would mark out all the holes in this uh, for this particular shot. Now, I think overall, when it was all said and done for me to lay out all these holes, to then afterwards, you know, paint all the holes with my paint and mark the inclinations for each of the holes it probably took me anywhere between an hour and a half to maybe two hours max maybe an hour and 45 minutes versus the blaster by himself having to try to stretch his tape out you know introducing human error making sure the tape is perfectly straight from one end to the other there's just too many inconsistencies where you know gps layout with this is in my opinion supreme to that um also we're getting more accurate accurate volumes now with this when the face is all cleaned up, we're able to go back in, calculate our shot volume, and we're getting a true um, you know, representation of the face. Uh, as I said before, every crack and crevice, the exact burdens at every um, you know, interval down the face, Astraos is calculating in order for us to yield you know, a perfect volume. So that's one of our quarries in New Jersey. Um, with the same customer, we have we you know service one of their quarries in New York. They're between, again, four to four and a half million tons a year. So these quarries are nonstop. They're always working. They always want to crush. So it's it was a challenge in the beginning until we realized um, what everything they wanted. And once we kind of dialed everything in, it's still only um, me and my coworker, and we recently hired someone new. But the two of us have been doing all of these, you know, um, these profiles nonstop. Um, now I'll probably take care of most of New York and then my coworker will do PA in New Jersey, but we kind of have, you know, our teamwork down together. We're communicating all the time where we can service all these places. And, you know, like I had mentioned before, at most we'll maybe even get 10 profiles in for a day, whether it's multiple profiles at one single quarry or we're tracking starting in New York and tracking our way back, you know, making multiple stops within a day. It's all about just being efficient. That's my biggest takeaway. Uh, this particular quarry, uh, it's the largest pattern as far as I'm aware that we shoot in the in our company. It's a 15 by 18 pattern, very large pattern. Um, uh, we're getting really great breakage out of this out of this um, this pattern. This is kind of where I was talking about adjacent shooting. Um, we have this where this layout is. I have down below. This is the west wall, and then on the right hand side, this adjacent face is the south wall. Now you may not be able to really tell, but this uh, right side of the shot is actually drilled. Um, I do not believe the stemming's out, it may be, but this is kind of where I was saying I'll fly an extra area. I knew they wanted to shoot over here. So kind of to plan ahead and make my trip the most worthwhile to get up here. You know, I initially flew this whole area, would upload to the cloud, and then I could go through and bore track all of, um, I believe this is 34 face holes. So I can get multiple things done um, being as efficient as possible while, you know, there's really no downtime. So this model will be up and running. I can duplicate this model and then I will have one model for this face that is going to shoot, you know, within the next day or so. And then I can also start to produce a drill plan with, you know, known floor elevations, known bench elevations and get this drill plan up and rolling. So when the driller is done, if he's not done with his shot on the right already, or he's on a different shot drilling, I can have this to them and there's no guesswork. We're getting again, um, you know, perfect hole depths where they need to be drilled to and there's no downtime. So that means the driller is always moving. There is always going to be shot rock on the ground. So the crusher is always moving and that's just good for production. Um, also kind of a, another reoccurring theme is we're also maintaining a very level floor with these uh, ground control points. I would say this floor here, uh, I believe it's negative 264 floor elevation. And not only do the loaders do an excellent job maintaining that grade, but it's also been super helpful having, you know, precise hold depths to maintain that floor as well. So here's another example I have in New Jersey. Now, this is a pretty uh, messed up face. Uh, maybe not so much the face, but the bench itself. Um, this is kind of referring to when I talked about before the limitations you have with, you know, your 2D impulse laser, laser, maybe your terrestrial 3D um, photogrammetry software, or even a burn pole. Um, this specific quarry is expanding their mine, so their mine limit has increased. 
So they're trying to now strip off the top layers. Now the there is no immediate bench below um, because now they're down three, four, or five benches or whatever <coughs> it may be. Um, and trying to get an accurate burden profile report on this would be near impossible. You're going to be standing down maybe 200 feet trying to find, you know, scale this. That's There's no way you're going to get an accurate measurement. So something here um, utilizing, you know, the aerial 3D photogrammetry is huge because we can set up, we can put out ground control points. We can, you know, put some on this crest line up top um, that we have up here. And then we can put some midway and then down the floor and we'll get a nice gradient of exactly what this face or this bench rather is doing from top to bottom. Then we can get some ground control points on the very bottom left. You may not be able to see, but that will kind of be our, you know, floor. And from there, when these all, all these points rectify, we can then pick a spot on kind of this slough material as to what we should be shooting to. And we can, you know, uh, make a very, very accurate drill plan off of this. Um, also with that being said, uh, this is kind of a difficult and tricky area for the blaster to lay out with this heavy of a slope, trying to maintain a nice straight tape from, you know, left to right or whichever way can be, you know, proved to be fairly difficult trying to keep all the rows straight. Everything looks good, especially with this slope. So here's another example where utilizing ground control points and the GPS system would be, you know, supreme in that case rectifying the model, getting the drill plan. And then from there, the, the blaster will design it. Many of our blasters are well versed, um, in, you know, utilizing Strauss. Um, I've trained them, you know, a number of times. So they are designing these shots and Strauss all themselves. They just let me know it's finished. And then I'll go out with a GPS and, you know, kind of with my Rover stick out these points and everything looks good to go. Um, one of the other issues that we kind of have at this particular location is as that mine limit is expanding, we are also getting very, very close to, um, you know, nearby dwellings, nearby houses. So we want to make sure that we're correctly profiling, getting, you know, good, accurate profile data. We're making sure we're not, you know, introducing any sort of error with over drilling. So all of that, you know, combining together, we want to, you know, have the best possible shot as we can. And by doing that, we can prevent fly rock, um, by getting good profiles, making sure everything's kosher in that sense. All right, so we're getting towards the end, but uh, one thing I want to talk about are the four key pillars. I'd argue um, into you know having the best blast optimization possible. Um, first and foremost is are the people. Obviously, myself, Ravi, any technical, um, you guys in the chat. We are the people that are going out there that are learning this, you know, uh, hardware, software, um, and going on the field and doing this every day, um, you know, or whatever it may be. So investing in keeping up to date with the current technology, knowing what's out there, what software is out there, what new, you know, tech hardware is out there and making sure that our employees in the company, um, are well-trained and they know what they're doing. Um, obviously, so that's first and foremost. I think I harped on this point as much as I could is the communication. I probably bug the heck out of all the blasters. As I've said, I call them all the time, making sure I know, Hey, what's, you know, what's the game plan? Have you heard anything from this Corey manager? I want to know that when I go to these places, we're all on the same page. We all know what's going on. They know what I'm going there for. Um, if there's anything I can get done extra, then, you know, if I can try to lay out something ahead of schedule, then sweet. That just helps us out. And it makes us all as a company more efficient, being able to manage and get to all these places, you know, as, um, as little as possible, but getting the most work done in those visits. Um, and also with that being said, this kind of plays into the communication and the training. Um, this is a team effort. This is not just, uh, this is me doing this. If I just, you know, went off on my own and, you know, didn't communicate with anyone, I wouldn't know what's going on. I don't know what, you know, elevations we're shooting to. I don't know what once what uh you know whether the quarry manager or what the blaster wants to do. So this is a team effort. And you know, I've been very fortunate that the team I work with, um, you know, through P Pennsylvania, New York, and New Jersey, we're all on the same page. We all know what's asked of us and what we need to get done. So having a great team has been super important for myself and you know, everyone, you know, within the team, making sure we're getting the job done as efficient as possible and you know, uh with having great results. Now to the process, um, I would say for the most part, a lot of our blasts now are processed digitally. 
uh, meaning we're not, you know, for some maybe uh, some areas, but we're doing a lot of shot designing in Straos. So it's all digital from, you know, acquiring the drone data we're capturing it digitally, we're processing it digitally, we're designing shots digitally, we're exporting it, you know, so on and so forth. So a lot of our things are being moved digitally. We're not, you know, drawing up shot diagrams on, you know, like a, a three, three thick uh, sheet of paper where there's a bleed through copy and we hand that to the driller. We're able to get, you know, some people's handwriting isn't the, isn't the best. So being able to have clear, concise, you know, drill plans, shot layouts. So the driller, and the blaster and everyone who is reading it is like, okay, this makes sense. I know what I'm reading. Um, building kind of a standard operation procedures, SOPs. I kind of mentioned that before um, with our one customer where we're doing a lot of this GPSing work. Uh, that's they told us what they wanted. And, you know, as a standard, we're all on the same page of, hey, when we go there, this is how they want it done. This is what they want. And then in the end, um, this is the the deliverables that they want to be able to see. So as I mentioned, it was those five key things. It was, you know, a drill plan. It was a, a layout burden report. Then it was a color deviation report, a post drill um, drill plan, which is just having the whole locations of where the holes were moved to. And lastly, a burden report of, uh, you know, implementation of bore track data. And then lastly, in the process, we have um, identified three or four KPIs to improve and celebrate success one is achieved. And then we just repeat that process over and over. In regards to technology, um, we are getting, you know, from when Straos first started and when we first started using Straos or even, you know, with drones or uh, 3D photogrammetry, as you all know, technology is increasing very rapidly and any sort of bottlenecks that you may have run into before either are non-existent now or they're less than they were before so as as technology grows and expands you know this this industry and especially using this technology is just getting better and better to make our blast safer um and you know higher um you know production better productivity all all around ai ai learning is kind of a big thing that you know has been talked about over and over and over uh, you know, AI learning, some people are worried about, you know, uh, robots taking over with AI learning, but, um, you know, Straos's AI program has proved to be super useful, especially if we have, you know, set number of issues or something we're trying to improve, we can look back and say, okay, well, this shot had a lot of oversize. I don't like how the muck pile looked in this and the AI, you will teach the AI based off of, you know, uh, repeatability of these blasts. It will learn how that muck, how the shot initially looked to how the shot looked in uh, post blast. And by flying that muck pile, it will learn, okay, this is, was the outcome. This was the, the final, uh, the finalization of this blast and it'll learn how to adapt and make a better blast moving forward to get the sizes you want, um, particle size, and to make sure your muck pile is the way you want it. Um, if I didn't mention this before the, uh, cloud-based collaboration, this is probably my favorite thing. Uh, it seems pretty, pretty easy, but I, the whole cloud-based software is one of my favorite things. Software we use in the past, as many of you may realize, it's very localized, meaning it's just on my computer. It's just on someone else's computer. With the cloud-based, um, everyone's literally on the same page. We all have our logins to Straos. We log in, whether I do a model or a blaster does a model and they need help and they want me to take a look at it or vice versa, we're able to kind of all log in see what's going on and we can all kind of give each other, you know, whether it's constructive criticism or kind of tips and tricks. Um, it's, there's just a lot of ways to stay, you know, very team oriented and making sure we're, you know, everything's getting done properly. And if it's very easy to reconcile a problem when we all have access to the same models or the same programs. Uh, lastly is the culture. Um, this is a super important key pillar is the culture of how we want our, you know, blast optimization practices to, you know, progress in the future. Um, we're focusing on the long term. We want to make sure that when we are, you know, that we have, you know, a very focused team that's, you know, we consider that leadership with um, it is the strategic priority for, um, you know, blast optimizations. We want that to be a main concern. We want, you know, whether it's uh, Mauer and Scott or another company, whoever it is, we want to make sure that we're looking to improve um, ourselves as well as our blast performance. So we can yield the best results possible with the, uh, the most minimization of, you know, any sort of errors. We want to make sure our safety is great in our blast. Everything's going smoothly. We want to make sure we're having level floors, you know, this and that we just want to make sure that the culture and the team that we surround ourselves with 
is very important. And this is, you know, a, a primary concern with them just to benefit the whole um, industry as a whole. So some ROIs for our customers, um, obviously accuracy, I think, uh, you know, I'm a talking head now. I've mentioned that point many, many times uh, where we have very, you know, precision, uh, a lot of precision and very accurate layouts now, um, especially with this ground control point implementation. Um, one of the things that I wanted to bring up too is we can revisit boreholes from shot to shot. Uh, let's say you have a shot and you have, uh, you know, a, a little area, a little pocket where you had a lot of short holes, or maybe, um, you know, there was something that didn't seem right. And you want kind of wanted to locate where it was, but the shots already been, you know, has gone off. And this is, you know, a couple of days later because everything is GPS and all the models are rectified, we can re-export that data and we can go back into those um, quarries and we can kind of say, Hey, to the loader in 20 feet, we had, you know, 10 short holes in that area. So, you know, once you start moving in, you know, be, be careful because when you start to drop your bucket down and to scrape up, you're going to hit a hard spot because those holes were all short. So just kind of a heads up, or if, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you had a misfire and a booster didn't go off uh, and you kind of have a guess where it is, we can reorient the shot because sometimes post blast, when you're looking at the face behind, it's tough to figure out exactly where, Hey, where was this hole? Where was this hole? Um, we can go back in and look through and, you know, stake out some points, Hey, between here and here, I think we may have an issue just to keep your eye on it, um, for, for the loader. Um, as if again, maintaining perfect bench heights, that's pretty self-explanatory. And then again, the shot volumes, um, we're, you know, our volumes were coming in super, super precise relative to, you know, doing them kind of the, I'll call it the old fashioned way, doing it by hand. We're getting, you know, accurate volumes from, you know, repeating these shots over and over and over again. And it's good for the customers because they know now they're getting very, they know when they're crushing their numbers should be, you know, dead spot on to what they've put through the plant. Consistency along with accuracy, we want to make sure that we can consistently provide the same results, um, and the same quality of work time and time again, which I believe we have been doing. Um, we're able to keep the drills moving constantly. We have, you know, per, you know, I keep saying perfect drill plans. I, I'm just saying that because we're able to maintain, you know, proper drill depth. there's no guesswork in and okay, this hole goes up a foot or two. We're just maintaining proper drill depths. Um, everything's GPS. Um, and then we're also able to lay out ahead of schedule. I know with that, those adjacent shots, I mentioned flying an area larger than you needed. That was my main point is staying ahead of the driller because we're just keeping production up at, you know, full speed. We're keeping the driller busy. And then when one shot goes, we're able to move back over and get the next one laid out. With all that being said, um, you know, profitability, if we can get more shots on the ground, keeping the drillers busy, there's always keeping the crusher moving. That's just better business, maintaining your stockpiles or even growing your stockpiles if we're super ahead of schedule. So, you know, by doing that, that just, that's more money in the pocket of the customer, just because we're able to, you know, keep up with the demand of, you know, the customers that they have coming in that are asking for stone. Um, and then I'll, the, my last little point is, you know, again, smart drills, removing that extra step, um, kind of removes more time spent in the field. You're able to just put a smart drill in, give him the data and he can go off and, you know, drilling and there's no other, you know, communication other than that. Uh, and I believe that's everything. Awesome. <clears throat> well, thank you, Zach. This has been amazing uh, to just kind of learn about how you have like uh, uh, created this workflow as well as the scalability part, how uh, efficiently running uh, at a scale uh, this repeatable process. It looks like a lot of work but it's like so seamless and smooth. <laughs> so that that's kind of the big takeaway. And another thing is the culture part, which is essentially uh, making this as a strategic priority, not just a special projects, right? Which is, I think the, uh, you have uh, this workflow, which seems like this is ingrained on a daily basis. So it becomes a part of the process and the culture. Um, so, the, you know, thank you for uh, doing the session here. Uh, uh, we ran out of the time today because I think the, the content was so much great. Uh, we won't be able <laughs> to uh, uh, take a time to uh, answer the Q&A, uh, but we will respond to the Q&A uh, over the email when we send the recording link. 
Uh, I know folks probably have to uh, get into the another meetings or start their day. Uh, so thank you for sticking around, uh, you know, another 15 minutes. Appreciate your time and uh, thank you for joining in uh, today's session. Uh, Zach, once again, uh, this has been amazing. Thank you for uh, uh, being the today's uh, guest speaker. Yes, thank you very much. And thank you everyone else for tuning in and staying a little over schedule. Um, I hope you learned something. Um, and I hope you kind of see, you know, regardless of your scaling, whether it's large or small, um, you, you, you can do it. it. It just, again, it, it may be a little daunting at first trying to be like, well, how are we going to get this done? But, uh, once you kind of find your, your niche and really get your, you know, foot in the door and you know what the quarries are asking of you and what they want, you know, you can see we're all over the place and you can do a lot more than you would probably be initially, um, thinking you could. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. See you next time. Right, thank you.